All right, it's 45, and I'm going to start right on the nose because this is going to be long, so bear with me. Uh, before I start, completely unrelated, can I get a show of hands? How many people here know what a maple bar is? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, we can talk about this afterwards. All right, so uh, welcome to my session. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I'm going to talk about uh, agile things. Um, if you looked on the schedule, you'll notice this is an intermediate session. So uh, if you're expecting to be taught what Scrum is, I apologize. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, but what I will use this talk to talk about is um, some pretty honest things about how we do things at Amazie Labs. Um, some things that we're not particularly proud of, but that's what happens when you're growing and you're trying to become better. You share the things that you learned the hard way uh, so that other people don't have to experience those same things the hard way. Um, so another thing that we're going to talk about is um, we're going to go through kind of some of the how we did things, and there will be parts during this session where you'll have to do the squinting game to see what I've put on the board. Um, don't worry. Afterwards, I'm going to post the slides, and you can come and talk to me, and I'm happy to show kind of the back end of how we do things in JIRA if you have questions. Um, so no panicking. Cool. Uh, so the first thing is, um, again, this will, uh, uh, sorry, who here knows what Scrum is? Fantastic. Uh, who here does Scrum or wishes they did Scrum? Okay, cool. So there's some of you who haven't raised your hands. Uh, buckle in. It's going to be confusing. Um, so again, this is not going to be a how to do Scrum talk. Um, this is the how we did it at one point and how we do it now uh, talk. This is going to be um, a little bit of anecdotal. It's going to be a little bit of real life example. So bear with me um, as I try to explain things uh, in tiny piecemeal of things that are much bigger. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we do, what we've learned, and how it's worked for our team. Um, it's going to be a little bit abstract in parts, um, but hopefully my examples will explain themselves. Before I go into too much detail, uh, I'm Stephanie. I work at Amazie Labs as a project manager. We are based out of Austin, Texas. Hello. Some of you might also know me because I used to be uh, Amanda from uh, the Drupal Association running DrupalCon. So if my name sounds familiar, that's probably why. All right, so a bit about Amazie Labs. Uh, we are an agency that started in Zurich, Switzerland, and we are now located in Austin, Texas, and in Cape Town, South Africa. So we're a little bit all over the board. When people ask how we pick these locations, I joke that we just took some darts, threw them on the board. It's kind of what it looks like. Uh, recently, as of uh, last Sunday, actually, we all got back from Amazie 10, which was the Amazie Labs 10-year uh, reunion celebration that we had down in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, this is a bus of our 50 closest Amazie buddies. Um, and it was a really great time for all of us to get together and uh, see the faces that we associate with uh, Slack names during the week and just get an idea of what people are like in real life. It was really great. Um, this is sort of the culmination of what I will be talking about. So it's a little bit Tarantino'd. Uh, you're seeing the end, the beginning. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit about um, Amazie Scrum as it once was. Uh, Amazie Labs is located, again, in three different locations, um, and with this comes a couple problems. Um, we try to be kind of a uniform team, so not just located and distributed, but also working together and independently, and this causes um, quite a few problems because time zones, locations, cultural differences, uh, work style differences. Zurich started first, and so they had their own kind of established rhythms and rules. Austin started and sort of did their own little Wild West approach to all the things, and then Cape Town showed up and they just wanted to play. Uh, one of the problems that we had is that each team sort of worked independently and each team worked um, with a project manager and a tech lead at the beginning, and this caused a lot of problems. So what would happen is um, all that information was being bottlenecked in those two people, and it wasn't getting to the team until much later. So uh, when we would approach projects, uh, we would have issues with um, specification coming from one person, so the team couldn't actually begin work until tech lead has said, here's what we're going to do, here's how we're going to build, here's the list of all the things that you need to configure in Drupal. Uh, go ahead and get going. So that caused one bit of concern. Um, another point is that it caused a single point of failure. That person who was the tech lead could never go on vacation because if they went on vacation, everything on this side broke, which is a bummer. Same thing with the project manager. If they weren't there to speak to the client, then the client message never made it to the developers and nothing happened. So uh, tons of um, inefficiencies there as well. 
The other problem is that the tech lead and the project manager had a great relationship with the client, but the team who was actually implementing it did not. So there was no tribal knowledge, nothing to pass down. And if you passed a project to another group of people in the team, it was either no knowledge was passed, and so you were looking at this build and saying, I wonder why they did that, and talking to 17 different people to figure out who was actually responsible for making this do that, and that was uh, incredibly inefficient as well. The other thing is that when we would finally pass a project to someone else in the team, uh, it took so long to get that person on, up to speed of what was happening that it was almost not worth it to pass the project on. So these were all little things that were uh, problems. Another problem with the way that we used to work is that um, we, we tried using Scrum. We thought we were implementing Scrum. We were quite proud of ourselves, but we didn't really have a baseline for how we would approach projects. So we went from saying, okay, well, right now we have a tech lead and a project manager, and let's just do Scrum instead. We didn't really do any training. We didn't really uh, bring the whole team up to speed. We just said, here's a project. Now estimate how long that project is going to take. And the team kind of looked at each other and we were like, seven? I don't know. Um, so uh, that was very problematic, obviously, because we didn't know how to communicate things to the client because we were all like, do we do it in story points? I don't know what a story point is. People keep saying things about t-shirt sizes. I just know how many hours I think it's going to take. And so there was a lot of disconnect there as well. Another problem with the way that we scrummed was that uh, we had multiple clients. Um, we don't have the luxury currently of having just one giant dedicated mega client who allows us to do scrum in the way that scrum should be done. Um, and so we had clients who we would do scrum with where you have the scrum ritual of a start and a stop. But we started and stopped with each of the client at, on, on a different day. And so what that ended up doing is creating a start a sprint start almost every day of the week and a sprint end almost every day of the week, which made the team very sad. Uh, it also made it really difficult for, the, for planning because the people, the clients that we had at the beginning of the week got obviously the bulk of our time and the clients who came at the very end of the week, we just got really good at apologizing to. Sorry, you get like three, I don't know. So that didn't work, obviously not a great idea. Uh, but to us, in the moment, um, we thought we were doing Scrum okay. The clients were happy. We got projects done. Nothing caught fire. Um, but looking back on it, uh, it's a little bit like your 20s where you realize that maybe it wasn't so great and maybe you were sitting on the floor of your house because you didn't have a couch and maybe you were using a Frisbee as a bowl. Yeah. So it was time to change. Um, we now had these three companies. We were working on um, improving our brand, improving our team happiness, improving our client happiness, um, and we figured it was time to do something. So at the beginning of January 2016, uh, the management got together and said, it's time to change. So what we did is we brought in Superman. No, we brought in a, um, a professional. So someone who understood Scrum and could explain Scrum to our teams and actually give us the proper training to become uh, an agile team. Um, the good thing about this is, is that the management didn't just say, surprise, new thing is happening. They actually said, surprise, new thing is potentially happening. We're going to approach it in a very tiny way. We're going to see if it works, and if it works, then we're going to move towards it. But we're not just going to surprise you and expect you to get it right away. So uh, what they did is they found a client who was open to, uh, to learning Agile as we learned Agile, which worked out really well. It's kind of hard if you have a client who is very set in their waterfall ways and wants to continue in their waterfall ways to say, hey, we want to do training wheels with you. How does it make you feel? Especially the Swiss clients. Like teaching the Swiss clients how Agile works was not a Swiss thing to do. So uh, fortunately, it worked. The client was happy. The team that they used was very happy. And uh, all the teams, after having seen this, said, OK, cool. We're bought in. We want to be part of this new experiment with you. Let's do this. So uh, Michael Schmidt, our CTO, uh, put on his training hat and then flew to all of the different locations and brought the good word of uh, Agile workflows to the colonies. And it worked out quite well. Uh, one of the things that was a big change is that we went from having 
uh, teams by location to having teams within a location. So um, Zurich had enough people, I think they had 24 at the time, to actually split into two different teams. Um, previously, their stand-up was 24 people standing in a circle and doing rounds, which took half an hour, surprise. Uh, so they split that, and so each team became dedicated, and each team named themselves, and each team became used to having their own independent stand-ups that took, obviously, less than half an hour every day. Uh, one of the biggest things about uh, learning Scrum that we had to digest uh, was that we thought we knew how things worked. As I said before, like we made projects happen. People were happy with our projects. The teams were happy-ish with our projects. Um, so we just had to take all the information that we thought we knew about our workflow and just sort of had to throw it away. And that was both refreshing and terrifying. So. Uh, when we all went in there um, after this new rebirth, uh, it was a bit of a, a baby step for all of us. So out of this, uh, quite a few things changed, and that's what I want the rest of this talk to be about. I didn't want to focus on all the, the negatives, and I wanted to focus instead on things that you guys could also do or potentially learn from uh, for your companies as well. So some of the things that we changed is that uh, we restructured meetings, and I'll go over that in a bit. Uh, we involved the team in all of the things, maybe to the point where they're not so thrilled with it, but it works out for the best. Uh, we added a Scrum Master. We enforced story points rather than estimation by hours. Uh, and we really, really um, harp on team testing. Super, super important. Uh, and it sounds like a lot to be like, these things are new and different, and it totally was. Um, but at the end, I think that it worked out. Uh, the other thing is that we kind of played it forward. We didn't just surprise our clients and say, hey, this is the new way of doing things. Uh, be on board or don't. We, we approached it the same way of, um, we're going to do this new thing. We would really like it if you were on board with us. Are you on board with us? And they were. So after we learned the scrum ways, we went to our clients and said, now it's time for you to learn the scrum ways. And they learned scrum with us, uh, which I think worked really well. Had we come to them and said, surprise, here's a new way of doing things, I think it would have ended a lot differently. Um, but in the process of, of doing it, we didn't just come to the clients and say, hey, there's a new strange new fun thing, let's do it. We shared with them, like, here are some of the pain points of why starting and stopping sprints on different days are not good for you. Here's why this thing is not good for you. Here's what you'll benefit from by joining us in this change. And after the second de uh, demo meeting, uh, I think the clients start to, get, to start to get it. Um, we started our scrum rituals uh, early, and uh, we've stuck to those scrum rituals since, and uh, since implementing this existing, and new clients have all kind of uh, helped hit that rhythm with us. So one of the biggest changes is uh, we changed all of our client meetings from being kind of scattered all over the week to now all starting and stopping, or starting on the same day. So for us, this day is uh, Tuesday, so we call it Demo Day Hell because this is the day that we're going to be in meetings, um, we're going to be talking with clients, we're going to be demoing things, or we'll be doing uh, backlog grooming. So Tuesday is just kind of dedicated as you're probably not going to get a lot of work done, but make sure that your brain is turned on. So it worked. Uh, the other thing that we did about this, again, keeping in mind that we have uh, two other offices, is that we synced our scrum, uh, our, our sprint weeks, so that we all start and stop at the same time. Um, I believe one of our Zurich teams starts on Tuesday while we start our, on Wednesday. Uh, but for the most part, our two-week cadence is all the same time, so we can actually pass tickets back and forth. But I'll get into that also later. Um, so this is now what our sprint le week looks like. Um, it looks like there's a lot of things on there, and there are. But keep in mind, before, this was being done multiple times all throughout the week because we had multiple clients all throughout the week that we were doing this for. So now we actually had dedicated times uh, and client scheduled meetings to, to perform all these things in. So while it looks on paper like it's very complicated and time-consuming, it's actually more efficient than the way we were doing it before. So I'll just go through these uh, really quick. So um, I don't have header labels on this because I don't want like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to influence what you guys do. Uh, it's really how your team works best. 
Um, but for the sake of the two-week sprint, here's what we do. So on Wednesday morning, uh, we start the sprint. Um, immediately afterwards, uh, we do ticket planning, and I'm the project manager on the team, so this means I walk away, and I leave it up to the developers to huddle and go through the tickets and figure out between themselves like how we're going to approach this week. Um, to cut ahead a little bit, they're also part of the sprint planning, so they shouldn't be surprised by the tickets that they see. So this is more of a technical, like, okay, if we're gonna do this, this, and this, we need to start over here with this ticket, and this client wants to do some kind of a launch by Friday, but not on Friday, so we need to make sure that this ticket is done um, a little bit earlier, and it's their way of kind of getting ahead of the work before the work actually uh, snowballs. Um, the other thing is that we do daily stand-up, but if you notice, daily stand-up is not on every day. Um, we don't do daily stand-up on the same day that we do uh, sprint start because the dev team sitting around talking about what they're going to do kind of already is that. Um, again, on uh, the Thursday following, and I'll, I'll get to that later, that's also a super busy day, and so people kind of know what they're going to be doing on those days. So daily stand-up Thursday, Friday, and Monday. Uh, and then Tuesday is client day, so we do backlog grooming. We do not do backlog grooming with all of our clients. We only do backlog grooming with clients who have a project that's active enough to actually meet. So some clients we meet every week, some clients we meet every other week. They're cool with it, we're cool with it. It's very clear about when the meetings are gonna happen. Um, on Wednesday, just like we do with Tuesday, every Wednesday is a meeting for the sprint. So the alternate Wednesday is sprint estimation. We take all those backlog groom tickets, we do estimation. This gives us a little bit of a barrier before we start the next sprint to ask questions, uh, see if any of the technology has changed, make sure we're on the same page with the client and with the team um, before we start the next sprint. Another thing that we do is um, on Thursday before the sprint ends, we do a board review. So we pull up the board and say, is there anything on this board that scares us or won't get finished or is blocked or whatever? Um, it's a little bit different than the daily because this is uh, like the, the panic final review before the weekend. And then Tuesday, the day is, that's the last day of our sprint, we meet, we do uh, the retrospective. The retrospective we do as a team, we don't do it with the client. Um, and this is our chance to sit down, talk about the week, things that we liked, things that we didn't like, things we want to do better for next time, um, and to get those things all laid out. So um, the cool thing about the way that we've implemented Scrum is that each of our teams do the retrospective differently. So our team takes a Google Doc, because everyone can write at the same time. We have columns, uh, what we liked, what we didn't like, what we want to change, and then each person spends five minutes just filling out their name under their section, and then we review it. We have a team in Zurich who takes a Google drawing, and they use GIFs and drawn things and smiley faces on the spectrum of smiley to frowny uh, to indicate how they feel, and for them, that's good enough. And so um, that's just one of those examples of how we've all um, embraced Scrum, but how we all kind of flavor it differently so it works for the team. Um, another thing that has changed is that everyone attends meetings. So before you had the project manager and the tech lead attending the meetings, and now on big projects, everyone who's going to be working on that project attends the meetings. Um, and the reason that we do this is because we were losing a lot um, in the, the game of telephone. So tech lead and project manager would go, they would come back and relay the good word from the client, team would say, but what about this, that, and the other thing? and the PM and the tech lead would have to go back to the client, and things would just get lost in the middle, it would take too long. The team who was implementing it didn't quite get invested in the project because they were just being handed tickets to do, um, which was fine, but it's just, it's better overall if the client, if the team can feel like they are part of it and have some choice in the matter. So this has actually helped us with a lot of things. Um, before, when it was just me and the tech lead meeting with the client, or sometimes just me meeting with the client, and the client would ask a question, I would sit there and think, mm, should I respond to this? Or should I say, oh, I have to go ask the team, because I don't really know this, because I'm not a developer. Um, and that kind of pause sometimes uh, doesn't help with building uh, trust with the client. And so it's actually nicer to have someone there who's experienced with that, who can actually say, yeah, I know the answer to this, or no, I don't know the answer to this, but I'll go find out and let you know. Um, constantly having to be the person who says, yeah, I don't really know the answer to that, just sort of makes me look not efficient, which I think is a good improvement. 
um, because I want to be there to do like budgets and keeping the, the team happy and all the things that the project manager should do, not the I'm going to come back to you later. Um, the other thing is that technical ears hear differently, hear things differently than non-technical ears. So I might hear from the client that they want to have uh, something that moves on the home page. And to me, that means, oh, a slider, a slideshow. But to the tech team who might understand this differently, it might be, I want to have an animation. And so having the tech team there to actually interpret these things makes it so that there's a lot less um, left on the table. Uh, another thing that we learned how to do better, remember that bowl of M&Ms from before, is that we learned how to estimate as a team. We learned how to take a pile of tickets and understand the amount of work that we expect to go into them, and then also how much of those tickets we're able to deliver uh, at the end of the sprint. So this actually helped us um, continue to build trust with the client because we would say, hey, we're going to get these four tickets done for you because they're X many points. And then at the end of the sprint, we're actually able to deliver them because we're used to uh, being able to produce this many story points uh, in a sprint. So the good thing is, is that uh, we figured it out. The hard part is, is that it was really difficult because going from, you know, uh, t-shirt sizes, hours, whatever, and then everybody's own interpretation of how long it takes to get something done. Like if you ask a front-end person how long it's going to take to do a back-end task, you're going to get a little bit of a mismatch. But over time and after doing a lot of estimation as a group, we've all sort of hit the rhythm. Um, and as we do that, uh, it, it becomes sort of a, a game. Like how many uh, times can we all hit the same number during story, uh, story poker uh, at the same time? So we've turned that from something kind of painful into something kind of fun. Uh, so one of the ways that we learned how to estimate together is that we, uh, what we call estimating in Anna's. So if you look at the Amazing Labs website, um, you can see that there is a, a, a person page for each of the employees. Um, so each of the person pages looks like this person sitting on the couch and then a description about them below. Um, the way that we started our estimation was to say, how long do you think it's going to take to implement this? And uh, at the beginning, when we were learning how to estimate, we were not fast. So these uh, estimation meetings probably were about two hours until we kind of got the hang of it. And now they're closer to half an hour or an hour. But that first uh, month or so was pretty painful. Um, so the way that we figured this out was to, was to uh, figure out what it was that we needed to do on this page and all the different elements uh, that went into it. So it wasn't just how do we do this. We were actually talking out how to write the acceptance criteria for a ticket at the same time. So if you're looking at this, you've got a hero image, you've got uh, an H1. Ignore the top thing because the header is already part of the website. Um, and so we started to learn to talk through the different elements on a page and not just say, give me this thing, I'm going to take it, and then when I'm done building, I'll throw it over to the, fr the front end person. Now we look at it as, in order to do this, we need to be able to do all these things, have it tested and out the door by the end of the sprint. So it was a little bit different way of looking at uh, how you would approach new work. Another thing that changed um, is that we took on writing tickets, but like I mentioned before, we've, we do Scrum, but we kind of do Scrum in our own flavor. Our team decided that writing stories, user stories, wasn't the best way for us to understand and interpret tickets. So, you know, I don't, you've probably seen the, the phrasing of blank, uh, so that blank, whatever. We, for us, that was too, up in the air and it left too much open to be decided and uh, at the end of the day like the, the developers were like but I don't know what to do and I'm glad that you're giving me this freedom but I would rather be told some more structuring and so based on that we uh, structured our tickets a little bit differently so uh, now if you see one of our tickets and we'll go over the tickets later what you'll see instead is uh, the task kind of uh, shorthanded up in the title and then acceptance criteria that helps lay out what this is. Um, in the acceptance criteria or above the acceptance criteria, what we'll do is we'll try to figure out um, what the business value is, what we're hoping to accomplish, and what must be part of delivery, which is essentially a user story but written in words that we like. Um, so a little bit about backlog grooming um, that might be a little bit different than how you guys implement Scrum is anyone can make tickets. Uh, and I present, when I presented this before at Bad Camp, there was like shock and awe uh, happening in the, in the crowd. Um, the reason that we do this is because uh, if you're a developer in there and something breaks or you notice a thing and 
uh, you want to flag it, you might be able to articulate that thing better than coming back to me and saying, hey, Steph, this thing happened. Now I need you to make it be not technical. Go do that. So now if a developer finds something, they'll make a ticket. They say, hey, Steph, I made a ticket. And I'll be like, great, cool. Let's add it to the backlog. We can figure out if it's an on-fire ticket or if it's a great-to-have ticket or if it's just a ticket that if we don't end up fixing by the end of the, the story or by the end of the sprint or by the end of launch, uh, we as a team will feel, feel like we failed. So it's just a nice way of being able to bubble up uh, problems or tasks um, in real time rather than having to uh, create like a parking lot, lot uh, task list at the end. Um, the other thing that we learned to do is clear acceptance criteria. So even if a client writes the ticket, um, it doesn't mean that the team cannot go in and edit the ticket. Um, what we try to do in that situation is to make a comment that says, hey, I'm changing this acceptance criteria because the way that you've written it makes it sound like we should launch on the moon, but I don't think that's really what you meant, so we're going to change it to something that we think is a little more realistic. Um, the other thing that we do is a shared definition of done. Uh, we went through the, the exercise of figuring out what those duns were, and um, we're happy to realize that those are not going to be things that can last on every ticket. It's just it becomes too burdensome and heavy to have it be part of every ticket. So some examples of definitions of, of done items are uh, browser testing, functional testing, um, tech review testing, code review testing. You're not going to do a code review on a design. So it's a little bit unnecessary to have all of those things apply to all tickets all the time. So when we do uh, ticket testing or when we do um, a ticket, we make sure to kind of outline what those, uh, those dones are going to be. Um, but as we go through the process of doing tickets week after week, we get um, a shared vocabulary of what kinds of things we know are going to be expected out of a ticket. So, for example, if we have a design ticket, that design never sees the client until the tech team has seen it. Because we don't want to say, hey, client, here's this pretty thing. And then after the client says, yeah, I totally want that thing, the tech team goes, yeah, there's no way that's going to happen. We're, we're getting a lot better at communicating early uh, and being able to present things that the team is already comfortable with so that the client doesn't get uh, shiny things taken away from them. Um, the other thing is that um, we've enforced the freedom to split, split tickets. So for example, um, back to that Anna example, if we find out that the Anna picture needs to uh, rotate into a different uh, picture um, halfway through someone being on that page or some kind of thing that's not really clear when you look at it, we have the ability to say, OK, we're going to deliver that piece with Anna um, as the header, but the animation will come in a second ticket. So being able to go through and split the ticket so that it's more manageable and can still deliver something usable, um, but that still identifies that there's more to be done later. Um, the other thing is reinforcing prioritizing, and it's not just for the client that we do this. It's also for the team, because our team loves making shiny, pretty, beautiful things. And sometimes we see a thing, and it makes us sad in our heart to not be able to focus all of our attention on it immediately, because other things need to happen. And so again, creating tickets um, allows us to say, I, I realize that this font is not the ideal font. Uh, maybe if there's time at the end of the project, we can just uh, get that done, and maybe we'll just eat the cost of getting it done because it's not broken. The client thinks it's great. I don't think it's great. Um, so now that we've talked about some processes with, uh, with clients and with the teams, I'm going to get into some of the, uh, the juicy technicals. Um, and this is probably where you're going to be sad about not being able to see clearly some of the examples. Apologies in advance. Um, for those of you who don't have JIRA, just Maybe pull out your phones for a few minutes. Um, for those of you who do, um, I'll be able to show you what the guts of this look like afterwards, if you'd like. So this is our backlog. Hello. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go over how some of it works. Uh, this obviously isn't the whole thing, but this is the digestible part of our backlog. So it's broken up into three sections, uh, the current sprint. Um, the upcoming sprint and the backlog. So the current sprint, um, as I mentioned, we have four different teams in Amazie Labs kind of all over the world. Each team has named themselves. Our uh, Austin team is Scrum and Coke, which yes, we think is super clever. Um, and this is, as you'll notice, um, multiple projects being listed in here. So uh, one of the big changes that we made was to uh, take all of our client boards and merge them into one mega board. Which we're very excited about. 
Um, on this, you can see a couple things that are uh, useful. You'll see uh, there's um, epics listed, there's people assigned to tickets, there's story points, there's a priority in there, even though you can't tell that there's a priority in there um, of things that need to get done. And then uh, you have the upcoming sprint. So we handle this upcoming sprint probably a little bit differently than some of you would. Um, I know that Scrum tells us that we should be uh, in real time, like doing all the things. Uh, we're still people and we are still a little bit OCD and so we'd like to know kind of what's coming up next sprint. And so uh, depending on the project, we might actually have one or two um, upcoming sprints listed out just to help us keep track of the tickets and the order that they come in. So what you're seeing here is once the sprint is done, in theory, we're gonna tackle this next sprint uh, in this order. And this is to sort of help keeps track of stuff. Um, this doesn't mean that what's happening on here will happen. Um, what, what sometimes happens is that uh, maybe green 59 will end up in the um, prioritized for sprint multiple times until we get tired of seeing it and then go send it to backlog land where it will live forever until the project is over. And then we look back on it and say, hey, remember that one time that that one ticket was there? Yeah, I mean, I think it was so important. Um, yep, so uh, another thing about this is that we try to implement priorities with the client, um, but there comes times when the priority won't be able to be implemented because, for example, if the client would like there to be a tire first and we need to make sure that there's an engine actually because further down the engine's gonna be more critical, um, we'll take the priority and actually change it up. Um, the priority with the client really comes into play when we are discussing, do you want it to happen this sprint or next sprint? Once it's in the sprint, we sort of take control of the tickets themselves. Um, again, the backlog. Yeah. Um, another cool thing about this is, again, we've got four different uh, scrum groups going on at, at any given time. And so we have this cool quick tabs across the top. And so uh, depending on which project that you're working on, you can just click on the quick tab. It'll just show those tickets. But if you're in a different project team, I don't want every other project to show on my uh, board because that would make everyone super, super sad. So instead, we've implemented this thing called, uh, we've, Im we've implemented labels and added that to our uh, JIRA search string. And so now if Zurich says, hey, I want you to work on this project, um, all they have to do is add ATX to their ticket and it will show in our backlog. So it makes it really, really easy to pass tickets um, between the teams without overburdening um, each of the teams with all of the projects that exist in the Amazi ecosphere. Um, another thing on here that you'll notice is, so obviously I've like hidden the client names and with changed them out with colors, uh, but the ones that I haven't changed are actual um, internal projects. So one of the things that we do to sort of envelope Scrum into all the things that we do is we incorporate uh, internal stuff group-wide stuff and client stuff. So on this board, you're actually seeing internal work, I think DrupalCon, um, and uh, client work and uh, Zurich work. So it should be a board of doom, but it's actually quite nice. Um, one thing also to mention is uh, in the Scrum, uh, in the sprint, we, of course, take in tickets that we think we're gonna tackle, um, but sometimes things happen mid-sprint, so uh, the client will turn their website off, or I don't know. Um, but depending on what the, the issue is from the client, um, we'll take that, make it into a ticket, and uh, I'll check with the developer and say, hey, you got three seconds, I need you to look at this ticket. Uh, this thing happened, do we think that it's critical or do we think that it's a super easy fix? And depending on uh, the, critical the criticalness or the easiness of fixing it, um, we'll, we'll sometimes take in smaller tickets or uh, super critical tickets into the sprint. Um, but for the most part, we've gotten pretty good with our clients of saying, is this broken and, and will you die if we don't fix it? Or is this broken and can you wait until next sprint to incorporate it into uh, next week's sprint? And for the most part, they're pretty cool with that. All right, so that was JIRA. I blew through JIRA pretty quickly, um, but I'll mention a couple other things, I believe, later on. Um, retrospectives. So this is one of the things in the relearning of how to scrum that I think the team struggled with the most. Um, at, at first, we were like, I don't really get it. We're obviously talking to each other every day at the daily stand-ups. Like, we all kind of are aware of what's going on, right? Surprise, when we actually started doing the retrospectives and being honest in the retrospectives, we realized, oh, 
these are useful, let's continue doing them. So uh, I'm gonna share a little bit of our learning from the retrospectives. Uh, the first thing that we learned is that the retrospective is not a stitch and bitch. So we have an hour dedicated for the team to talk about how that week was. If the entire time is dedicated to just moaning, then everyone will feel like it was a waste of time and feel ne very negatively towards doing the retrospective. And so um, by enforcing those three columns of what did we like, what did we not like, and how can we fix it, that actually forces us to say, yeah, this thing really, really sucked, and here's how we're gonna do better next time. And so going through the process of actually verbalizing these things have actually helped the team feel like they're actually beneficial. So uh, just kind of embracing that as a useful thing has helped change our mindset about um, the retrospective. Uh, the other things that we've learned out of the retrospective is things like, uh, when you have a ticket and you are done with that ticket, uh, you put it into testing. And previously, when tickets went into testing, they kind of went there to die. And that was really lame because you would get to the end of the sprint and no one had bothered testing any of the tickets and suddenly it's Friday and everyone realizes that they have a day to test and fix anything in the tickets. Um, and that ended up stressing everybody out and everyone felt like it was maybe someone else's fault or maybe the PM's fault for not testing everything. And so realizing that uh, testing was um, important early and often, we, um, it, we embraced the mindset of treating tickets like a hot potato. That's a potato. So in the morning during daily stand-up, um, someone either mentions, hey, this thing went into testing yesterday, can someone test it? Or um, we use Slack to say, hey, this one's ready for testing, someone go and grab it. Um, and we have now a process of as soon as a dev person is done touching a dev ticket, a dev person will pick up that ticket and then test it. And then depending on whether or not we need design work, then our de designer will go and pick it up. And then once that's all done, I will pick it up and try to break it. So getting that done early and often and then sending it to me saves everyone the heartache of having me break it early but late. Another thing is that uh, story points are gonna mean different things to different people. Um, we once mentioned to our client who does Scrum uh, that a 13 by Thursday is, um, is one of the goals that we have and he looked at me and said there's no way that we could do a 13 in a single sprint. So 13 obviously means different things to different people but for us, um, a 13 would be uh, a pretty big implementation that we could get done during uh, a single two week period. Um, for us, when we do that Thursday board review, if that 13 is not in testing by the end of the day, we have failed. So that's one of our goals, get that 13 out the door so that we can test it and find all the bugs associated with it and get that ready for client demo. The other thing is testing. So I'm gonna repeat this again because we learned it the hard way. Test all your things. Um, of course, we're gonna miss stuff because that's just what happens when there's all the moving parts of a website. But if you test, you shouldn't be too surprised by really big things. Um, so some of the things that we've implemented is code review. Surprisingly, we didn't always do code review at the beginning. Sometimes we would do code review at the very end of a project and then you would be surprised and sad. Um, we would now do white box testing, which means Stephanie goes in there knowing what it's gonna, what the functionality should be, and then try to break it, which is fun. Um, including deployment instructions, which seems like a, yeah, you should totally have that, was actually not something that we had written down as a you must have. So now all testing includes deployment instructions and testing instructions if uh, the thing that you're testing isn't super clear. Um, and then also browser testing, defining what the browsers and the mobile devices are in the ticket because not every client has the same requirements. Um, so making sure that we have those uh, queued up to go, always part of it. Um, just a quick view of our JIRA board. Uh, this is what I talked about again. So if in the middle of you see that we've got internal and uh, internal testing and review. So again, like a design ticket, you wouldn't really test a design ticket, but you would review a ticket. Um, and with the client, depending on the client, not all of our clients are technical, and so that, that column just becomes demo, because um, not, not all of them are gonna go in and do actual client testing. We do have clients who love to do testing, and so they kind of go into that same column. Um, so uh, internal, things that we haven't started yet, uh, in progress, things that we're working on actively, um, and what you'll see in here is that there's no two faces. No one's face is on two tickets while in progress, unless you have like, two laptops open and you're actively doing something, it's impossible for you to do two things at once. 
in theory, so we try to encourage someone to not have their face on two tickets in, in progress. Um, and that also helps it so that if something needs to get done, like keep it on the to-do side and leave it blank so that if someone finishes their work on another ticket, they can go grab that. Um, otherwise, if you have your face on two things, like people are going to think that they're being taken care of and it, in actuality, like ticket B might not be touched at all. So that just sort of helps kind of keep everything uh, together. Um, and then one of the things that we do, but I'm not really going to go in here, is that we try to keep deployments out of the same sprint that the work is being done, unless we've communicated directly with the client and said, hey, this ticket must be deployed as part of this sprint, um, we try to keep them separate. So what we'll do at the end of a sprint is we'll, um, it'll go through the, the motions of going through client, um, client testing, and then after the demo is over, we'll create a new ticket that says deploy this ticket, and depending on how many tickets that we have for that project, it'll say deployment for sprint, whatever the sprint is, and then it'll list all the tickets for that project that are associated with the upcoming sprint. So this way it makes it so that the client has time uh, between the demo and the deployment to actually do some heavy testing, and so that we're not rushing it like Tuesday at two o'clock to like deploy all the things really quickly and hope nothing breaks. So it just sort of helps meter out the work, and it meters it out so that the client's not on fire and that the teams aren't on fire. And it's actually helped us um, get a better control on deployments uh, in general. Um, so along with this, team communication changed. I didn't think it was going to. I thought our communication was actually going pretty well, but um, the things that we're going to go over are some of the things that were surprises to me. Um, so one of the things is that now that we're in a more all-ticket-all-the-time mentality, uh, Slack actually became a great way of passing those tickets to each other. So um, our DevOps people that be have actually integrated Jira with Slack. And so if you mention a ticket in Slack, the ticket will appear in Slack. Um, and it's really easy to say like, hey, I'm looking at uh, yellow 52. Please go take a look at this. And then the team uh, uses that to just pass tickets back and forth or say, hey, I have a question about this ticket. What do I do? And that way, like email becomes a place of real business and not just a place where uh, information goes to die. Um, another thing that we do is that each of our Slack, uh, each of our projects has its own dedicated Slack channel, but depending on the client, our clients sometimes would love to be in Slack, and so they are in Slack with us in that channel, actively going through tickets with us and responding to questions. Um, or they're in Slack, and maybe we don't feel comfortable having some of the conversations about the project with the client there, and so we've got two. Uh, and we just label that our deployment one. So um, in all ways, we're still allowed to have communication with the team, and we're still allowed to have communication with the client, but we build ourselves like safety barriers so that everyone is comfortable with what's going on. Um, let's see. The other thing that we got really good at is uh, making comments. And again, this feels like a duh. <laughs> but um, w one of the things that we would go through is, is that a dev would pass a ticket to a dev. And maybe in Slack, they would say, yeah, good job, looks great. But in the ticket, there would be no history of any communication at all. So you would go from having a ticket being worked on and maybe some deployment instructions. And then suddenly, I would come in and be like, browser test, boom. And there would be no history of anything that happened between start at like point A and point B. And so that was problematic for a variety of reasons. For example, if you close a ticket and two months later have to go back and look at that ticket, you go, oh, I guess this magically happened and everyone was super happy about it except for it broke. So now we're super good about going in and saying, I have a question, um, I want you to review this, I need some feedback, and then documenting that. Um, even if we have a, a meeting to talk about something, someone is, is responsible for taking the notes or the outcome of that meeting and documenting it. That way it lives here. Um, as a result, uh, we also use Confluence, but as a result of getting better at um, using the comments, we've stopped putting so much in Confluence that's uh, real time and using it more for just client meetings and like uh, dev environment information. Like, so it's very static and Jira on the other hand is very vibrant. Um, another thing that we've implemented is more meetings, um, but in a good way. So now meetings don't suck. Uh, it's not always me as project manager calling the meetings. If um, one of our devs has a question, they'll either pull in all the other devs or they'll grab the designer or they'll grab me or we'll grab the client and do an ad hoc meeting. 
Um, and we actually encourage these now, and people actively do them on their own because now they feel more in control of what's actually being discussed, and they're not just sitting in a two-hour meeting trying really hard not to touch Facebook. Um, the result of this is that uh, devs are happier, uh, clients are happier because they feel like they're more involved. We're not just seeing them two times a week and then just being like, oh, you're surprised, here's a thing that we made. Um, they feel like they're more actively engaged in what's being, uh, what's being built. Um, another thing is that because we are a remote team and the team Austin also works from home on Fridays, um, everything that we do has to be treated as though you're not going to see the person that you're talking to in real life. So we've gotten better at doing remote um, collaboration and this can mean a variety of things. So one, if you're going to have a Slack discussion and the Slack discussion is going to become a book, call that person because like, everyone's super fine with like, typing a book, but the other person maybe doesn't like reading the book, and things get lost in just text barf. So get on a Slack call. We have Zoom integrated into Slack. I feel like I'm pitching a bunch of products, but it, it, it keeps us integrated with have all of these different tools kind of talking together. So uh, I ping one of my devs. I say, I've got a question. This thing looks like, oh, wait, hold on. Let's have a call. I'll do slash Zoom, start the call. Five seconds later, we both know what's happening and we both can walk away like knowing that the ticket is under control. Um, oops. Uh, one of the other things that we, uh, as a PM, have gotten really um, a lot better at is stop emailing your clients, which sounds kind of funny. Pick up the phone if there's a problem. Pick up the phone if you need something right away and maybe your client is prone to travel or you know they get a lot of um, email in their inbox because even though you as a team are involved in the project all the time, your client isn't part of your team in the fact that they, they have their own business happening. They've got their own people they're reporting to and they've got their own things they have to do every day. They're not in the project all the time, most of the time. So for you to think that they're gonna be available all the time is just not realistic. So give them a call, uh, get on a Zoom with them, uh, put a meeting on their calendar if you know that they're super busy, um, but just constantly have communication open with your client. Um, if they're in Slack and they're active, great, this maybe doesn't apply, but if they're clients who maybe need a little bit more coaxing or um, are more likely to say, yeah, just go figure it out, like whatever, get them on the phone call. It's a lot easier, it's a lot harder for them to not answer the phone or to not answer your question if you do that. Um, so now we're getting into the, the fun stuff. And again, I can talk about this offline because it's a little bit difficult to take like a 40 page document and put it on a screen slide. Um, but we also started in, uh, talking about Scrum with clients going into new projects. So we didn't want to just surprise them um, by, by uh, sending out proposals in a waterfall way and then when the project kickoffs, be like, surprise, Scrum. Uh, so now we have it in our proposals of, of how we do things. We include our project management approach. Um, we include, uh, we include um, estimations and we enforce almost to the point of being annoying. This is an estimation. Here's the definition of an estimation. It totally is not a promise. We're not going to get you 75 things for X number of monies because things change. Um, and we, re reiter we reiterate it in different ways so that it's not just if you change a thing, I will charge you more. We, we try to make it clear so that uh, projects are a living thing. If you change this, it might not make the budget change, but we might need to get some things off the table in order to deliver by the time that you need it. So uh, reinforcing the same idea, but in different ways throughout the proposal, just reinforces over and over again that Scrum is not just one part of how we do it, it's the entire how we do it. Um, the other thing that we do is we outline specifically that the client will pay for Scrum rituals. And uh, surprisingly, people who are new to Amazee are pretty cool with that. Like if we're clear, which is one of the things that we try to do um, in all communications with clients, if we're transparent and say, here's going to be a thing that we do, they're cool with it. If we surprise them with the invoice and say, here's a line item that we didn't talk about, then they get sad. Um, who pays for Scrum? So you saw our JIRA board before, and I mentioned that there were not just client things on the board. Um, because of that, it's not just clients who pay for Scrum. We acknowledge that we're going to have other things going on, and so it doesn't make sense for the clients to bear the burden of us doing all of our Scrum rituals. So this is a quick and dirty example. Um, at the end of every month, we do um, a Scrum report. Uh, as you can see, there's three Scrum, or sorry, th three sprints listed at the top. 
Uh, depending on the month, sometimes a sprint will fall kind of between a month, so we kind of have to uh, fake it a little bit. Um, my favorite months are the ones where the two sprint cycles land perfectly uh, between the first and the 31st. Doesn't always happen. But what this is, is it's math that po hopefully doesn't have a typo <laughs> in there. Um, but what it is, is uh, we take all the story points that were completed during the sprint. Um, we don't count ones that were started or in progress or anything like that. But this is only completed tickets. Um, we calculate them, so team, uh, Ticket Pink had 12 story points over the course of these three sprints. Um, in the, uh, the number of things, that was 2% of the sprint, so they're going to carry 2% of the burden of our logged hours to these um, events. So uh, to go back a couple of slides, we had daily stand-up, we had sprint planning, we had sprint estimation, we have sprint retrospective, all of these things um, that the entire team bills against. So in JIRA, we'll log, spend an hour in uh, scrum estimation, spent 10 minutes in daily stand-up. All of these hours are logged, and they go towards the calculation. So um, the, one of the things I didn't show here was just the count. So like in a typical sprint, we might do, or in a typical month, we might do between 30 and 40 hours in scrum rituals, which is a lot. Um, and again, it's also a lot to put on just clients. So this number will say, okay, you had 47 hours logged to these scrum rituals. Now let's see how much is actually billable. And so in the adjusted column, what I'll do is I'll take out all the internal work. So I'm not gonna obviously charge myself for them, but I'll just remove it so that um, only the things that we're actually gonna pass on to the client um, show in the calculation. So for this one, uh, Team Yellow, they had 3.56 hours of time, and that shows in the work log, um, the JIRA work log that I pull for all my clients as uh, SNC strategy and planning. We don't write out Scrum and Coke because not everyone thinks it's funny. But that's how it looks. They'll see it as a line item um, in their work log. All right, um, so my takeaways. These are just hopefully recaps of things that we already mentioned. Um, the team as a whole is way more efficient. Uh, quick plug for Amazee.io, getting, client, getting um, the team onto new projects is super easy. It used to take half a day to get um, an, a developer onboarded onto a project just from a technical perspective. Now it takes an hour, so that really helps. Um, clear communication, clear expectations, both for the team and for the client, makes everyone a lot happier. You go in knowing what's expected, you come out hopefully on the same page of um, marching orders. Um, we have better testing, which means the client gets a better product, and it means at the end of the day we feel much more pride in the products that we're delivering. The team is really confident, the client's really happy, and the team is super invested in the final project. Um, one of the things I didn't put in here was uh, the team launches. So every time we do a, a, a website launch, the team kind of throws a little party because for us it's a really big deal. We spent a bunch of time building this thing, we're really excited about it, and so we're gonna celebrate. Uh, so now, the, uh, all of the Amazies are on the same uh, Scrum cycle. We're all doing Scrum properly now instead of our own uh, broken variations of it, and we're all really happy with the variations that we're using that are all working. Um, we can pass tickets between each other, uh, and communication and uh, relationships with all the op other offices have actually improved. Um, and in uh, conclusion, everyone's super happy. Uh, we all live happily ever after. Does anybody have any questions? Yay. Cool, um, I think there's a mic, if you wanna go to the mic so they can record what the question's gonna be. Hi, you alluded in passing and then moved on about how it was really hard and painful to convert the teens to story points. Yep. And I don't know if you can expand on that a little bit because on our teams, and what I'm getting from the devs, that, like they don't really see a use in that, and they're like, I don't understand story points. I just know how long I think it's going to take me to do something. So how did you kind of work through that? So uh, one of the, the, the hard things for us is that our team is really small. We're three developers, one designer, and me. And so to have me sit there and maybe give a story point estimate for how long it's going to take to build a skyscraper isn't maybe the most efficient. Um, but what it does is it kind of gives you a shared language so that when things come through, you all start to grow a shared understanding of how much time certain things take to do. 
we do acknowledge that hours do play a part in uh, story points, but we also acknowledge that it's not just the getting those people in the room or getting that person in the room to actually deliver the product. Sometimes it's a matter of how many different pieces are we gonna need to pull in in order to get this done? Are we gonna be able to do this all internally? Are we gonna have to go find someone else? Do we need to have a third uh, vendor come in and do something? And just having those discussions of what's, what we think the ticket means is helpful. Does that answer the question? Okay. Well, just in case it didn't, I just wanna drill down more into that same question as it were. And um, so there's always this tension in Scrum where it's like this ideal world of Agile is where we just push business objectives into work and then let the developers figure out the implementation, right? We're trying to get away from telling the developers to say, do this so that they just do it and it's done. And then later the client says, well, it's actually broken and the developers say, well, you, this is what you told us to do, right? We're trying to get away from that, right? And so we want to um, leave that stuff open. But, um, but then you have the other tension of saying, we actually want to get the stuff done, right? So we want to know what it is we're doing before we go into work, right? So there's those kind of conflicting yep. goals. And estimating is kind of the ground where all that kind of the tension actually comes out. So... Um, because if you're estimating hours for the purpose of like saying, how long is this actually gonna get done? Or, so really the question is, can you really talk into this question of what you are trying to get done when you are going through the process, particularly like in, in the backlog refinement, especially, but then also in sprint planning. Yep. In your mind, what are you actually trying to accomplish when you're talking about estimates? What we're trying to really do is figure out how complicated something is. Um, because if we identify all the moving parts of delivering a ticket and we realize that uh, we don't know how to do a ticket, we'll estimate it extra high. So if we're handed a ticket that says, I want a Ferris wheel, we're like, well, I think I know what a Ferris wheel is and I think I saw something on dribble.org that might be a module for a Ferris wheel. I need to go look at it. Um, we'll estimate that, that ticket high and at the end, if we're wrong and it's actually a three because the module did all the things we wanted it to, then we'll change that story point from a, like a 13 to a three. Um, and, and it's just the matter of, of having the understanding that we can be wrong when we're doing story points really helps. Um, for the most part, the, once we're in the project, we have a better rhythm of getting the story points right. Um, but usually it takes a month maybe, like two full cycles of a sprint to realize, yeah, we got a handle on the project. We understand what the client says when they say X and Y. Um, but for each, each, uh, each client, it's different. And I actually do a report where I pull all the hours worked in a sprint against all of the hours, uh, all the story points estimated on a project and come up with a, um, an average of how many hours it takes to do uh, that, those, those deliverables. And for the most part, like if we have a project that's existed and we kind of figured out and know how it goes, like a story point per hour ratio will be like an hour maybe, and a new project will be somewhere closer to like 2.7. So there's definitely a range. Um, but we do try to stay away from hours because then the, then the developer feels beholden to that hour. So like if they say, well, it's gonna take four hours, but they can't do four hours because something exploded or they just didn't understand, then they feel really guilty if they're not able to deliver under four hours. And so we, we do that to help keep the developer from feeling that guilt and also to just communicate like, I don't know how to do this, it's super complicated, or I know how to do this and it will be super complicated. Yeah. Um, so I have kind of like a two part question. So one is I know scrum roles, you're not supposed to share resources across multiple scrum teams. We work at an agency and the nature of our work, that's like kind of impossible. So I was wondering, do you guys share resources across teams or no? Yes. You do, okay. <laughs> so then my follow up question to that is how do you prioritize the client work then, like internally? Yep, so what we do is we actually treat the PM person on the other team. So uh, we've got another team in Zurich called, uh, no, our Cape Town team is Death by Burgers. And so their PM for their team will act as our client. Um, they will be the client uh, intermediary go-between to us and we'll put them on our Tuesday uh, sprint cadence and say, uh, for example, Victor, um, you're going to meet with us on Tuesday. You're going to be the client. We're going to go through all the rituals as if you were the client and we're going to take all of your tickets for this project as if you were a client project. And 
just add them in. So depending on, uh, we won't add them if we're obviously super busy with client with our own client work, but if we have space, um, we might say, yeah, we can help you this sprint, or like we'll take all your information this sprint, but maybe won't be able to implement until the following sprint or two sprints away, and we've done that. Um, we've actually launched maybe like three or four different uh, non-Austin projects in the last, since 2017 started, and uh, before that would have caused like a big, like break in the wheel of things, but now that we have our thing, we just kind of move them in, uh, they're part of the machine, and they also understand um, how it works. So at the end of the day, the client's super happy, they don't know the difference, well, I mean, they know that someone else did it, but they don't know the difference in quality or, um, or routine, so they know what's expected of them, and the team is able to just absorb the new project and kick it out like they would something internal. Okay. Um, you said that you hired an, uh, an a Scrum expert. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how was the process, and what recommendations uh, can you give us to to hire the right one? I actually can't speak to that. It was all done on our Zurich side. Um, if you run into Michael uh, here, he's going to be doing a session in this room, I think at two. He'll be able to um, give you more of a rundown on how that worked and what they actually did in the office. We only got the kind of residuals of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yay. Um, I can talk to you um, afterwards if you have questions, but we are out of time. Thank you all for coming. Um,